Hello, everyone, and welcome to my session in this new edition of the PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit, the virtual edition for 2021. I'm looking forward to doing this in person next year, but in the meantime, you know, since I have to record this ahead of time, I'm going to try to take advantage of that and maybe throw in some other things that I can do because I am recording and editing a video. This session is entitled Power Up Your PowerShell Scripting. My goal is to show you some things that you may not know about, some things that aren't documented as well as they probably could be, but things that I think will help you become a better PowerShell scripter or maybe add a little professional touches to your work. So let's dig in. When it comes right down to it, really the whole point here is to make better PowerShell tools. And I wanna show you some techniques that kind of fall into a couple of categories. One, some things that you can do with parameters to make them more efficient or easy to work with or easy to use. I'm gonna show you some ways to make it easier to wrap other commands. A lot of our PowerShell functions and scripts that we write really are just wrapping up some other native PowerShell command like get service or get VM or get Active Directory user. So I wanna show you some techniques that I've been working with that simplify that process. And really what it ultimately comes down to is your functions or scripts need to be about the PowerShell objects. It's all about objects in the pipeline. So I have some other techniques that I use often in my work to make working with objects easier, richer, more valuable, a better experience for your user of your script or tool that you are making. And because our time is limited, even though this is recorded ahead of time, let me jump into PowerShell and let me guide you through and show you some of these techniques that I've been working with. All right, first up, I wanna show you what might be a nicer way to handle parameter validation. Now, because I'm gonna generate some errors, I'm gonna change the foreground color of any errors to yellow, just so they'll show up better uh, in the screen. And I'm using the PowerShell IIC because for me, I find it a better uh, demonstration tool than VS Code. So let's look at a function I have here, a very sample function called get folder size. Uh, it has an A list. Here's a, by the way, here's a quick little tip. Here's an easy way to add an alias to a function. So this is just gonna run some code to measure the size of a folder. And I have a parameter validation of validate script here that all it's going to do is just test to verify that that path exists. So let me show you this, let's load this function. And now let's just run this. Nope, I must not have, you know, there's an error in yellow. I must not have loaded this. Let's try this one more time. There we go, now that's loaded. And now I should be able to run, get folder size, so if that works, and that's the expected result. Now, let me try this with a bad folder. And I'm using the alias that's in there. All right, so there we go. The parameter validation worked. It said it cannot validate the argument on the path, blah, blah, blah. You see lots of information there. I'd like to make things maybe a little nicer. So we can do this in PowerShell. I still have validate script. But what I have done here is I have modified the script. <clears throat> this validation script has to return true or false. That's how PowerShell knows whether uh, it passed uh, parameter validation. So I'm still gonna do if test path. So if test path is there, the function, the little validate script can return true. But if it's false, you can do lots of other things. Um, you can only reference all the parameter. So I'm gonna throw my own error message saying failed to validate the path and I'm gonna make the, the path even all uppercase and then just return false. The rest of the code is all the same. So let's select that. So now that function version is loaded and let's run it with this bad path. And there we go. Now I still get you know some of that other error messaging but the message itself now becomes a little clear. At least to me it does. So it still says cannot validate argument. That comes from the parameter validation. But then there's my message that I put in, fail to validate the path, and then you can see the path all in uppercase. Nice little thing. Maybe it help you, maybe it won't. It's just, I find it helpful sometimes to write more meaningful error messages if I'm doing parameter validation. 
And of course, your experience with the error message that you get might differ whether you're using PowerShell uh, 5.1, which is what I'm doing here uh, in the IC, or in PowerShell 7. And I've got some code there that you can uh, experiment to try that out. So that's a quick look at parameter validation. All right, let's look at something else here. Let's go back into my code and let's look at some things that you can do to leverage PS default parameter values, but use it internally into your script. So I've been working on a module uh, called AD Reporting Tools. And I'm gonna grab just one of the functions from that. So this is a function that's in the uh, module called get AD canonical user. Its whole point is to uh, resolve a name if it's in the company slash user name um, or domain slash user name format. And I'm not gonna go through all of the code here, but what I do wanna show you is what I'm doing with PS default parameter values. Because a lot of my functions in this module are calling the Active Directory module, and I want to be able to use all the time to pass certain things along. For example, in this function, I'm allowing the user to specify the server and a credential because a lot of the Active Directory commandlets um, allow that option. So in my code, instead of trying to build splatting tables, which is another way to do this, I'm going to create a PS default parameter values that only exists within my script scope or whenever I run this command. So I've got some little code here because all I want for my parameters for this function are credential and server. So if the PS bound parameters contains either of those, meaning this command, person ran the command and they included dash server and dash credential, then I'm going to add them to PS default parameter values, but I'm going to do it in the script scope. So this has no effect on the PS default parameter values that the user might be having uh, in their PowerShell session. This way, throughout my code, anytime I run a command, like get AD object that uses server or credential, it will automatically detect it. And some of my other commands, I'm calling multiple Active Directory commands, and I don't have to worry about trying to pass the server name and the credential if the user specified it. That PS default parameter values handles that for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, import uh, my working code and Right now, let's look at my PS default parameter value. So right now I've got nothing defined uh, in my session. So I'm going to run get ad canonical user. That worked and I have the verbose output. You can see that it added server name to any command that was get ad something. And we'll do this again with a, a bad name. All right, so that all worked. And if I come back now and look at my PS default parameter values, nothing changed in my session. I was able to use them in the code itself. And so that's a nice way of grabbing stuff from your PS bound parameters. And then if you are calling nested functions, you know, native commands, again, we talked about this at the very beginning, a lot of times we wrap commands in PowerShell. So this is an easy way that I have found to be able to get information from the command and then pass it down to the wrapped commands. Now, depending upon the work, splatting PS bond parameters still could be easier. Here's another uh, function in the module called get AD summary. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do is if they have server and credential, all I'm doing is just going to take PS bound parameters and I'm just going to splat that right here to get AD domain. So because in this particular command, I'm not calling lots of other commands. All I'm doing is calling one command. Oh, I take that back. I'm also calling AD force, but the parameters are the same. So all I have to do in this case is just splat PS bound parameters. So if they specify server or credential that gets bound and I can splat that. Uh, the only thing you may need to do sometimes, though, is to change parameters. For example, here for when I get to the forest, I'm changing the identity to the forest name. Or you may also sometimes have to remove parameters uh, to get everything to 
line up. And I might as well show you this command so that you can see with the verbose output that I'm using, I can see the state of PS bond parameters and I can see how they are changing. Nice way to verify that everything is being used the way that I expect it to. All right, next, let's take a look at auto completion. So there are a couple ways that we can do this. Uh, we can do it via parameters, and this can be a more dynamic way than using validate set. So let me grab another function from this uh, AD reporting tools module and show you what I am talking about. So I have a parameter called category. So here's the actual parameter name. It has a validate script and there is an argument completer. This function is going to get me information about an Active Directory user based on a predefined bucket of properties such as department or password info. That information is stored in a global variable called AD user reporting configuration. And so I've got a validate script. And here's again a, an example of me using my custom throw message. But I also have an argument completer. The argument completer attribute here that you see is basically a script block. And whatever values that that script block returns, that will be used as the values for the argument completer. So let me show you this. Let's come here and let's look at this variable dollar ad user reporting configuration. So those are the values that I want to autocomplete. So let's run the command. We we'll use my Art Deco account category. And now I'm tab completing and I'm getting the information that I want and it works nice and neatly. So that argument completer simplifies that. That does not prevent someone from putting in something else. So let's put in a bogus result. And now my parameter validation comes into play. So you can have multiple entries here, multiple settings, and they kind of work as a onion, if you will. So one thing will work, then the other will work. And so you kind of cover all your bases that way. The auto completer, the argument completer simplifies for the user how to use the command, but it doesn't prevent them from putting in something else. And then that's where you want the parameter validation technique to come into play. The other thing that we can do, if I go back to the demo and show you here, uh, another option is to use a register argument completer. So this command is built into PowerShell. We have this in PowerShell 5.1. And if you look at the help, you'll see basically code that I have here. Just copy and paste it, just use it kind of verbatim. So what you're going to do is create a script block that is going to fill in the values for whatever parameter for whatever command. So in my example here, I'm gonna use get win event as the command and the log name parameter. And then what I'm going to auto complete for that is basically running get win event list log. Now you can put in a little of this dollar word to complete and you can use a wildcard there. So if you wanna add a little a wildcard options there, all of these names are then going to be created as a completion result. And so we're gonna invoke this little new method for this uh, class here. And we've got these parameters. I have a little comment there about what those uh, parameters are. So I'm going to run this. So now if I run get win event, log name and tab complete, now it's auto completing all of the results. Normally you don't have that, but with that argue completer, I do. Now you can also do this for your functions. Let me load up a function here. So this uh, very kind of a demo function, just gonna give me some service information. In the function file itself, I have an argument completer for my function for the computer name parameter. And that computer name parameter, I'm going to take as a value from a text file that's on my S drive. That's basically just a list of servers that are in my uh, domain. Whatever code you put in this argument completer, you want it to run quickly. So I don't necessarily want to query Active Directory. Uh, you could build in some caching mechanism uh, if you wanted to, but let me show you 
how this works now. So let's dot source that script file. And now if I do get service status, dash computer name and tab complete, this is pulling values in from that text file. And I now have auto completion for my function. You could do the same type of things uh, in your modules. And I probably picked a server that uh, isn't up and running right this minute, but you kind of get the idea there. I'm not going to wait for that to error out. That won't work, by the way, here. I do have a note to remind myself to tell you this doesn't work for dynamic parameters. So you can, because a dynamic parameter can't determine what to do until all the other parameters are complete. So you can only do an argument completer, as far as I can tell, with parameters that are static or predefined. And since I brought it up, let's take a few minutes and look at dynamic parameters. This is a topic that I get asked about often. Uh, people seem to think they want or need dynamic parameters. I don't think you always do, but let me go through and show you the process and then give you the pros and cons and you can decide for yourself. So I'm going to open up here a demo file. And this is just kind of a sample of how you would use a dynamic parameter. The whole point of dynamic parameters is that they don't come into existence until all your other parameters have been determined. This is because the dynamic parameter will exist based upon some condition. It could be a provider that you're in. It could be the state of some other parameter. Whatever the condition is, you have to define that. And then you define what you want that parameter to be. So this does require a bit more a skill uh, in your PowerShell scripting work. So in my example here, kind of a, a simple function that's going to create a new session. It really doesn't do anything but demonstrate dynamic parameters. So it takes a parameter for the computer name and then some other uh, remoting parameters. Then you can see after the param block, there is a dynamic param script block. And in this script block, this is where I'm going to put in all the code that's going to create a new parameter but it will only create the parameter if the computer name parameter matches DOM and then some number. Uh, the presumption is that this is a command that's being used to connect to a domain controller. And if I connect to a domain controller, I want to supply or force them to use alternate credentials. So you have to create that parameter. So I'm going to create a parameter attribute. I'm going to make it, let it take value from pipeline. Um, doesn't really have to, but I'm, I'm going to in this case, just to show you uh, how you can set some of these things. I'm going to make it mandatory. I'm going to put in a help message. And then you need to create a attribute collection. So these are all the things that are going to describe the parameter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just again, for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to create an alias for this parameter called run as and add that to the attribute collection. Now I'm going to define the actual dynamic parameter. So this is going to be a system management automation runtime defined uh, parameter. The parameter name is going to be called credential. It's going to be of this type, and I'm going to add it to that collection. And a lot of times I just use boilerplate code that I copy and paste all the time when I'm creating dynamic parameters if I feel I need them. Once that has been created, if you wanted to, you could give it a default value. Again, I'm just doing this for the sake of a demonstration. I probably wouldn't do this for a credential, but that's how I would do it. And then I'm going to create a parameter dictionary and then add my credential object. So here the credential is a parameter and I'm going to add that to the dictionary and then return that parameter dictionary. So what this looks like, let me load this function here. So if I run new my session computer name and I give it a domain controller name, because I made that parameter mandatory for the credential, now I'm getting prompted. But I can use it here. I could do if, even use the run as. So that all works. However, if I look at help, 
I don't see that dynamic parameter. This is one of the challenges of working with dynamic parameter. Let me go back and look at another uh, example here for you. Uh, this is a function uh, that's from a module, my PS Type Extension Tools module. This too is using a dynamic parameter. If the path that the user specifies to export their type extensions is a PS1 XML file, then I'm going to create a new parameter called append. It's going to be a switch and it will allow me to append to the uh, PS1 XML file for whatever it is that I am uh, extending. So I'm not going to see this here. Let's load this function as well. Just kind of reiterate this. If I do help export PS type extension, so I don't see the dash append parameter. What I've done in the actual function itself, that's part of the module, when I built my external help, I added the documentation for that. So that the, and I have to make it very clear that that parameter exists and that it is dynamic. And you'll only see it if you use a PS1 XML uh, file extension. So that's kind of a, a challenge there. Sometimes you can check to see if the parameter is dynamic. Uh, get command has a way. So here, look, using get command for that function, see, it doesn't even see that append parameter. However, sometimes you can see it. Um, I'm going to use a command here called get parameter info, which is from my PS Script Tools module. And if I look at the get ad domain command from the Active Directory module, and look and see if it is dynamic, all those parameters are dynamic and they are detected. And the Active Directory module uses dynamic parameters quite a bit. Now, the only thing I can think of, and I've not tested this and I'm not a developer, so I don't know if this is a true or not, but my suspicion is the Active Directory module is binary. And so get command can determine that it is a dynamic parameter and my script function export ps type extension is not and so it doesn't detect it regardless um, you can create dynamic parameters documentation and making sure your user understands what they are used for and what is required in order to use them is going to be the big challenge there and again there's some coding that you have to go through to create the entire parameter itself but you have some examples there that you can take a look at Next, let's look at a few things that I am using all the time now, it seems these days in my scripting work. Something that I think you'll find very useful, not only in creating your scripts that you are maybe writing for other people, but maybe also just in your day-to-day -day running PowerShell from the command prompt. And that is type and format extensions. And I've built a number of tools to make this even easier. So there's really no reason not to do it. So here's what I'm talking about. We have in PowerShell this thing called the extensible type system. This makes it very simple for you to take a PowerShell object and add to it, make it whatever it is that you need uh, to get the job done. Now type data can easily be extended with the update type data commandlet. You basically give the type name and what types of things you want to create, like alias properties, script properties, and that sort of thing. PowerShell does this all the time. You just maybe don't realize that but you can also create these same types of things for your own work. And here's how. Easiest way to do this is to use my PS Type Extension Tools module, because this will wrap around the update type data command, kind of simplifies it for you. You can go through and read the help for how to do this update type data, go right ahead. Uh, but I'm gonna show you my module here because I think you're gonna find this much easier. You can install it from the PowerShell gallery. And then I've got these commands because the nice thing and one of the reasons I wrote this module is if I create the type extension or create a bunch of type extensions for a particular type, say a process object or a service object, I need those extensions every time I run PowerShell. So I wanted a way to make it easy to export them and then re-import them without having to retype it or copy and paste stuff. And so there are commands in the module uh, to do this. I've also recently added support for property sets. Now the thing about a property set 
is that that requires a PS1 XML file, which everyone hates writing XML files. So I have a command there, new PS property set, that will create the XML file for you. Then all you need to do is run update type data, give it the XML file, boom, you got your property set. So let me show you how this works. I'm gonna create some extensions to system.io.fileinfo, and I'm gonna create an alias property. Let's just kind of go here word by word. I'm gonna create an alias property called size, and the value is gonna be length. So instead of having length, I like size. I think of files in terms of size, not length. I'm an old school kind of guy, so that's the way I'm gonna approach it. So let's let it have size as an option. I'm also gonna create another property, a script property called modified age. And this is gonna use a script block. And in the script block, I'm going to create a time span object that's gonna take the last write time of the file and subtract the current date time. One tricky thing here is the object you're referencing is dollar this, not dollar sign underscore, but dollar this. It's kind of like doing select object with dollar sign underscore, except this is a type extension, so it uses dollar this, but the end result will be the same. I'll get a time span of showing me how old that file is since it was last modified. So let me go ahead and add those two. And then I even have a little command here to make it easy to see what's been added. So for the system io.fileinfo, uh, there's the size and modified age, those are the ones I added. PowerShell added version info and base name. However, now I can run a command like this, and there are my custom type extensions that I created. So now I have output that's more meaningful to me. This is something that you might want to use, as I said, in your day-to-day -day work, or if you are building a PowerShell module and create some custom objects and want to add some type extensions, this is a very easy way to do that. In fact, that's what I did with this Active Directory module that I've been building. So I have here a PS1 XML file that I built that this actually has a property set for an Active Directory user account called names that references these property names. So I don't have to do select object. I can just reference this property set. And I'm also creating, in this case, some alias properties uh, for that as well. All I need to do in order to use this is I'm gonna go ahead and import this module. And now if I use uh, my commands from the PS type extension tools, there I can see the extensions. This doesn't show property set because property sets for some reason don't show up this way, but I can use it and run get ad user with a filter and select my custom properties, which are aliases. And now I have exactly what I want in a form that I want that's easy to use. You know, there's no complicated select object with those sometimes very cumbersome and tedious hash tables. Very nice, clean PowerShell, and it's really not that difficult for you to, to do. I have a little link there for some additional reading if you want to learn more about this, but I find myself using type extensions all the time, and I think once you get the hang of them, I think you will probably use them a lot as well. The other part to this are formatting extensions, custom formatting. In Windows PowerShell, PowerShell has a set of PS1 XML files in $PS Home. These control what the output looks like when you run a command like get service or get process. It formats the resulting objects in the pipeline. In PowerShell 7, those PS1 XML files have been internalized and are a part of the compiled code. Although we can still use a PS1 XML file if we want to add our own custom formatting. The problem is it's XML which everyone hates trying to write XML. So I wrote a command called new PS format XML, which is part of the PS script tools module. Again, you can download from uh, the PowerShell gallery. So I'm gonna show you two ways uh, to do this. One is something I use all the time because I'm always living in a PowerShell prompt and so I've extended it to me as quick and as useful and as easy as it can possibly be. So I'm gonna create a file and then I'll show you how it works with uh, in a module. 
going to create a custom format for file objects. And in fact, I'm going to use the extensions that I have already created in this PowerShell session. So new PS format XML requires just a single instance of the object that you want to format. So eventually I'm just going to get a file C work test.txt. And I'm going to pipe that to new PS format XML. Now the params I'm going to use are these. I'm going to just splat them here. So I'm going to select these properties and some of them that modified age and size, those are the type extensions that I added. I'm actually going to group by the directory property. I'm going to give my view a name called age. Otherwise it would be default. And because I already have a default view for file objects, I don't want to modify that or change that. I just want to create a, an additional view called age. And then I need the path to the PS1 XML file. Typically the format of the file that we use is your object type format or formats .ps1 XML. So let's grab this hash table and grab that single item and create the new format PS1 XML file. Real quickly, this is what it looks like. So you didn't have to create any XML. PowerShell, my function does all of it. And I have even comments because there are other things that you can do to extend this. You can put in things like script blocks if you wanted to customize a label or if you wanted to customize the script block. So instead of using the property item, you could put in a script block to tweak it or adjust it in some way. I also have the files are automatically set to auto size. Although if you don't want it to auto size, you could just comment out the auto size option there. And the parameter widths are all set based upon best guesses, based upon the input object that you used. I have that file. Now I need to load it into PowerShell. So I run update format data and give it the path to the file. And now that that has been added, I can do a directory. I want to get just files because I'm not taking directories into account here. Pipe to format table and specify the view that I just created called age. Now I have a new view of file objects and you can do this for all sorts of things, which is really quite cool. So let me show you what I do now with modules because I use that same idea. Coming back to my Active Directory module I've been working on, I have a lot of format files that I have been generating. So I've got all these because I'm creating a lot of custom objects to make it easier to consume data out of the Active Directory module. And I created almost all of these with uh, these tools that I've been showing you. So here, for example, is the AD summary object. Now in this case, the object I'm creating is totally new. It doesn't exist. And so this view that I'm creating actually is the default view. So when I run get AD summary, by default, I'll get the formatted view of the object the way that I want it to be. So I have it loaded. If I just run get AD summary, there is the default output. That is not the entire object. You know, I can still do get ad summary. Pipe to select star. And I can see all of the properties. And before I created the custom formatting file, that's in essence what I got from the output of the command. But now, again, let's just run this again here. I can run get ad summary. and I have the default output the way that I want it to be. Now, sometimes once you've created these formatting views, it's hard to remember God, what views are available to me. Um, and also, you know, what, what did PowerShell add? So I added another command, and again, back in the PS scripting tools module called get format view that will go through the formatting files and show you what the possible views are. So for get process, I theoretically can run a table. I can have table views of process priority start time. Uh, and there's a wide view uh, called process. So those table ones are the ones that are interesting. Now that I see what those view names are, 
I can run things like get process, format table, dash view, process. And that's the default. That other view I think was priority. Now sometimes, some of these, especially that are grouping, you may need to sort in order for the output to work properly. And I have the same type of thing with my Active Directory module. So I can do get format view and look at this AD domain controller health, if I get the right line here. So I have two views here, and this is a, another approach that I took. I wanted in many of the commands that I wrote, I created a really rich object. And then I have a default view that limits what I think most people want to see. And in some cases, like this example here, I have an additional view that shows information in a different way. So I can do get AD domain controller health, and this will use the default formatting output. Gets me that information, formats it the way that I want it to be with each domain controller. Or I can run it and specify the table view info. This shows me kind of the same information, but reformatted in a different way. So using the custom formats is a terrific way to add value to your scripting work. The last thing I want to show you before we run out of time here is something that you know I didn't think that I really needed. Uh, it's not something I went looking for or thought I even cared about. But once I've discovered this, hey, I use this now quite a bit and it makes my day-to-day -day job a little bit easier. And that is this idea of running external scripts or running scripts from anywhere. And by anywhere, I mean the script itself can live almost anywhere. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In Windows, if you look at your environmental variable, and I'm going to split it on this case because it's Windows, a semicolon, these are the path locations that Windows and PowerShell will look for, you know, files and programs and whatnot. Most of these you probably already have. Now, one that's already listed here that wasn't here originally when I first started is the Program Files Windows PowerShell scripts. And that's the kind of the key point here of what I want to talk about. So let me go back and show you uh, how I got to that point. I know that PowerShell has this ability to install script. People will write a script, a PS1 file, and they can publish it up on kind of a script version of the PowerShell gallery. Normally, I think the PowerShell gallery is just installing modules, but there are people who write scripts and they share those scripts. And that's great. I'm glad people do that. I never thought that I really cared or was going out and looking for scripts that other people had written because I was fine just writing my own. And then I thought, well, let me try this thing out. And so I went out and I found this uh, script called WinFetch. Then I looked to see what PowerShell did when it installed that script file, because that's what I was kind of curious about. And so in looking at, and I've already installed uh, this WinFetch script, in looking at that with get command, I see the command, it's an external script. It's a script file, winfetch.ps1, which I can open up in my editor and look at the code. And the source, the location that it's in, is the program files, Windows PowerShell scripts. Cool. So that means that I can just type winfetch and it works. I don't have to type the full path to the script, which is what we normally need to do in PowerShell, right? Even though, and I can do tab completion, I can see that it is a PS1 file. Because it is in one of those external script directories, something that PowerShell can find in the path, it knows how to run it. So that means that I could put any script that I want in that folder, anything that I've created, and it should automatically run. I started playing with that, and then I realized, you know what, I don't wanna have the actual script in that directory, because if I wanna modify the script, then I gotta go and find it in that program files, and that's not my source directory, that directory doesn't get backed up, my scripts folder does. So then I discovered, oh, you know what, I could create a link to my scripts file in my scripts folder, 
put it in that location and still get the benefit of being able to run it everywhere. I created a file, a script file called create script links. And this will create linked script copies in my installed scripts directory. So it's going to use that path and then create a link to my source file in C scripts and put it in that external scripts folder. In fact, I'm going to create a link to another script of mine called get external scripts in the S drive, which is a shortcut to my scripts folder. So now, and the directory listing though, you can see under program files, windows, PowerShell scripts, there is a link. See, it's a zero byte file to get external scripts.ps1. Even tab completion works. So these now, are all the external scripts that I can find, but I'm able to run that script that get external scripts without having to type the path or remember where it is. If I make a change to the original file in my S drive or my scripts folder to this get external scripts PS1 file, the linked file automatically picks up those changes. This is really awesome because now I can create scripts and I've done this for a lot of my daily workload tasks uh, that I use with PowerShell scripts. I put them up in that linked folder and then I can just run the script. I even create aliases so I'm really lazy and I can run the script. I can keep the script updated and then I can run it everywhere that I want it to be. If I decide I need to delete it, or anything else, I can just delete the link and oh, not delete the comment, but actually run the command. And now the link is deleted. And if I run get external scripts, it doesn't work because I deleted that link. Now I still have the file in my scripts folder. That still works, but I no longer have it shared. So being able to create a link and have it in that shared folder is awesome because now I can run a full script file wherever it is and I don't have to worry about putting in the completion of the full path name uh, or anything like that. Great way of taking advantage of PowerShell and making my life easier with less work. And that's really what uh, PowerShell is great for us, right? Doing less work. All right, before I go, let me just leave you with a few quick things here. Uh, first of all, everything that I just demonstrated should be documented in the PowerShell scripting and tool making book uh, that I co-wrote with Don Jones. Uh, you can grab it from LeanPub. And with that, I wanna thank you for taking some time out of your day to uh, watch this session. I'll be around for a few minutes to answer questions in whatever time we have left. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I blog uh, there on the second entry. Uh, I have a lot of my work on GitHub and all the demos that I showed you again are can be found in that GitHub uh, repository for PS Summit 2021. Thanks for watching and I'll be chatting with you soon.